Because of the following special program, Mr. Merlin will not be presented this evening. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Long time coming talking to this guy, a, a Chicago guy that uh, I, I got to meet a few times at conventions. And I'm so glad to finally have him on Word Balloon. It's Stephen T. Siegel. Welcome. What? Stephen. I love that I get uh, status as a Chicago guy. I'm actually not. My wife is a Chicago guy, actually a Chicago gal. Uh, and that's kind of how I met you. But, yes. uh, but I love Chicago. I loved Star of Siam. I would eat there all the time. I lived in Indiana. Yes. Next, next door. So <laughs> if you live in Indiana, at least when I did in the 90s, you had to go to Chicago for something to happen to you. So that's what I did. That's cool, man. Uh, I will tell the quick story that, yeah, you know, um, back when I was working in radio in the 90s at uh, the rock station WXRT and the sports station The Score, our uh, our mutual good friend Susan Ferrar is like, hey, uh, this teacher friend of mine really wants us to come over and, and talk to her class about radio. And I'm like, all right. And I, <laughs> so I go, and it was me, Susan, and my friend Tom Couch, who was uh, the guy who made the commercials at both stations. And we get there, and uh, and Stephen's partner, Liesel, is wearing this really cool kind of baseball jersey sort of DC jacket. Yeah. And I'm like, Liesel, where, where'd you get that? That's fantastic. <laughs> And she's like, and of course, you know, this was, this was a long time ago. She's like, oh, my boyfriend, you know, Steve and everything. And she's like, you know, he writes uh, Steven Siegel. And I'm like, I know Steve Siegel. I love his comics. That's fantastic, <laughs> man. And then a couple of years later, we finally met face to face in San Diego. Yeah. So it's either a small world or the Matrix is really out of memory and just has to reuse people over and over again. <laughs> That's why I'm your guest now. Dude, it's it's outstanding. And I, I'm, I'm really glad to talk to you. Weird timing, I guess, with the WGA strike. Of course, Steve, Steve, Joe Casey, Joe Kelly, and Duncan. And how do I say Duncan's last name? Rulo. Duncan he is Rulo. the Chicago guy, by the way. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. we we did a, a voice thing for one of our cartoons, Generator Rex, and he had to say the word jetpack, and he kept saying jetpack. And they're ah. like, where are you from, Chicago? And he's like, yeah. So <laughs> That's outstanding. Well, the four of you guys were smart years and years ago after making your marketing comics and uh, up in your game and then creating man, man of action the wonderful production company that good lord i mean we, I'll, I'll pop up images but we're talking about great stuff like ben 10 and hero hero 6 and uh a couple marvel animated shows along the way and generator Re generation rex rather generator uh, yeah generator pardon me man yeah. say this is where the 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 former saturday morning uh, cartoon <laughs> guy uh, might might slip every now and then but no That's man it's, good. yeah you know i mean Really uh, well done to all of you. I've I, you know I've talked to Kelly and Casey, uh, the Joes, and everything about it as well. But yeah, man, it's like really well done. 
truly. Well, it wasn't intentional. I mean, let's get that out of the way. We didn't go, let's conquer the world by making a company together. We literally got tired of how big San Diego Comic-Con was getting and wanted to sit down and watch it move by us instead of us moving by it. And so Joe Casey or Joe Kelly, one of the Joes was like, let's just get a booth. So I was like, all right. And I went over and I said, we want a booth. And they're like, well, what's your company name? I'm like, hang on. And I <laughs> talk to you guys. I'm like, we have to have a company name. And Joe Kelly's like, okay, we're evil geniuses. I'm like, okay. So I went back. I'm like, we're evil geniuses. They're like, tip, tip, tip. nope, we've got that. I'm like, hang on. I went back. Joe Kelly's like, man of action. I'm like, all right. I went back. I'm like, we're man of action. They're like, flip, flip, flip. Okay, we don't have that. So that's literally how we became a company was wanting to sit down at San Diego and have someplace to put all of our books and comics under the table as we bought them instead of carrying them around. And while we were sitting there, the first three years we did that, people came up each year and hired us to do jobs because they thought we were a company. And then we would get like paid a check that we could not cash because we were not a company and didn't have a bank account. <laughs> And so like the first year when that happened, we took this job and did it. I was like, well, I guess I'll go open a bank account. And I went to the business bank and they're like, well, but where's your operating agreement and your business license? I'm like, hang on. And, you know, we just go. We would we became a business by default to cash checks that we got by default because people thought we were a company because we had a table at San Diego. <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. All of that is wonderful. It turned out OK, but planning, no. Let me uh, let's let's get uh, some WGA stuff out of the way. We, you know, we're in the midst of the writer strike. I've been talking a lot with, um, you know, with writers and also writers that are uh, producers as well. And um, does this I don't even know right now if you've got any active uh, animation or live action. I mean, mostly, obviously, you're known for uh, uh, animation. But uh, well, first of all, yeah, I mean, so are you on like a weird standing because you're you guys are writers but also uh, producers uh no i mean we've all but, been or are in the writers guild uh currently and we've done live action stuff that obviously would be completely off the table animation is covered by the guild only if it's kind of what used to be called prime time series animation nowadays what does that even mean right uh, and the spaces that we create for primarily your kids spaces we have some other stuff that you know uh that we are not working on at the moment um, but the the kid stuff, we had to talk to our lawyers and our managers and just say what what's off limits and what's not. We're not working on anything that's off limits. And if somebody is, you know, a struck company, we're not going to cross any picket lines to work on stuff. So most of what we're working on is fine. Uh, if it wasn't, we wouldn't do it. And we're in sure. solidarity with writers because we're in the guild. So, yes. Yeah. No, I hear you, man. You know, honestly, uh, the, the radio and television guild merged with uh, the Screen Actors Guild. So, and we just, you know, authorized to strike earlier. Uh, the, was it earlier this week or last week? I can't last remember. Last week, yeah. It was last week. Thank you. The end of last week. And, and um, you know, I voted to strike. I stand with the, the writers as well and know how important and valuable writers are. And, and I mean, it's so basic. I, there was a knucklehead on Twitter that's like, well, you know, a lot of TV shows and movies suck, so they shouldn't get more money. And it's like, that's not what it's about. That's not, never what it's about. Well, I mean, the, the main thing with all of this stuff is that there's always enough money to meet these demands. It's just the for, for whatever reason, the not Hollywood, but the model of business is, will you come up with everything and then give it to me for nothing so I can make everything off of it? Yep. And the answer is no. But for my entire lifetime, it's been like, but I'll do it for very little and you can have everything else, which they're fine with. Uh, and then when you go, you know what? My very little is too little. I need a little more. They're like, you're killing me which is not true. And so we do this little dance and it, it's designed to make sure that they don't give any more than they have to. Uh, and then we move along. We're also executive producers of all of our shows. Right. So I do understand the other side. There are economic factors that go into all of this stuff, but the basic truth is that there's a lot more money on the producerial side that could go to some of this stuff without breaking the bank or bankrupting anybody. Agreed. I mean, it, it really is that basic. And God, I mean, honestly, Chris Cantwell, Mark Guggenheim have been recent guests that have, you know, kind of explained things. And truly, man, no, like you said, uh, it really has gone from, OK, we're going to pitch you. But if you want to develop and stuff, give us money. And now it's like, no, 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 no. you got to really give us a lot, not just the concept, but maybe in a couple of episodes and things like that. And when, I, when I started, because uh, I've, I've had some live action stuff in Hollywood, sure. not uh, most of it not produced, but you used to be able to make a living off of that even. 
Um, but you could pitch the, I sold a TV show to Fox back in the day, uh, that I went into a room and I pitched an idea like that wasn't even very well thought out. And they're like, we want to be in business with you. And they bought it in the room. And then I had to go write it. Like I had to figure all of it out after that. You know, I had very little. Now, if I go in to pitch something, they want to have a script to read, maybe two. They want it cast. They want to know who's directing it. Like they want everything done and delivered. If you would make the show so they could watch it first and then decide, which some people do, like there are people who do things that are bought on acquisition, that would be even better. <laughs> How much risk can they offset to you so that they don't take the risk? And again, from a pro producerial standpoint, that makes perfect sense. But from a creative standpoint, who can afford to do that? Exactly, man. Literally, the writers can't even make a, a, a middle, uh, a, you know, a, 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 a you know, just a, a, mid, a middle class uh, income. And uh, really, uh, Guggenheim said it best a couple episodes ago, where he said, you know, it, all we're asking for is like, you know, kind of a middle class wage and writing shouldn't be a side hustle or where you need to Uber drive or wait tables or whatever while you're getting stuff made. And it's yeah, kind of yeah. crazy. Yep, it is. Yeah. It is crazy. I mean, there's there's some stuff they're doing better. I like I think representation has been a big issue and they're quick to move on that because it doesn't really cost them anything. <laughs> so okay. if it's an issue that doesn't have an economic underline per se, hallelujah. But if you're going, you know what, we need a little more money in the retirement fund. And if you're going to use AI, you have to compensate us. And you're making us do the work of 12 people that used to be the work of three people that used to be done by 12. So that should have an economic offset. As soon as there's money, it's like, we can't do that. Well, they can, they don't want to. I'm hip. Absolutely. God, I wonder, really, I'm not going to San Diego this year. I can only imagine what it's likely going to look like if this continues. It's five weeks away. And I don't know, you know, God, and I didn't even know the Directors Guild got all their demands. And they, it's like, they, okay. did, but they had a very different set of demands and there are far fewer people in the Directors Guild. Sure. Uh, it's economically, it's not quite the same offset. Okay. Uh, I believe I'm just talking out of my ass. I have no idea if that's true or not, but I think it's true. Uh, I'm going to say it's true for now, and then it can be disproven in the comments, I'm sure. Uh, but they also didn't have quite the same take on AI that we have, which is another big issue. You know, it's like ChatGPT can already write an ad that's not bad. You know, it can write uh, business copy for things that's not bad. And it's just going to be minutes before you put in, you know, a, a few terms and it spits out an action movie that's not bad which in and of itself is, you know, it's creepy, but that's technology. Yeah. However, what's going to happen is a screenwriter who used to get seven figures to write an action movie is going to be told, here's the action movie, polish it for $25,000. And somebody's going to say yes. And then that's going to be the going rate for writers. Good Lord. So that's, that's a big issue that's being negotiated as well. You know, and I've heard this from previous comic writers and artists uh, before uh, that, that of, of earlier generations than, than us. But did you see something not similar in terms of mechanics, but really pure economics uh, in comics where maybe you were getting a certain page rate or a certain, you know, script rate or whatever. And then um, all of a sudden, as you know, and as your example with uh, with television and film writing that, you know, there's always another writer that's going to be willing to do the job for less money because they want to break in. I don't know if you experienced anything like that. It's, you know, it's not just comics. A lot of businesses sure. read about it. It's, again, the person with all the money wants the rest of it. And so they they go down to the lowest common, not denominator, but person willing to take the least money. Yeah. When I started in comics, I started at Renegade Press, Denny Lubert's company. I did a comic called Kafka. And I was paid whatever the costs minus the profit, profits minus the costs, whatever was left over was split up with me and Stefano Gaudiano, my artist. And that was it. You know, and on the first issue, we made like 600 bucks. We're like, wow, we're in college. We made 600 bucks. The second issue, we made like 300 bucks. We're like, wow, we're in college. We made 300 bucks. Third and fourth issue, we made like 50 bucks. We're like, uh, and you know, uh, so that was my first job. When I started working at DC, which was the first mainstream company I was at, my rate was pretty low, but Karen Berger, God bless her heart, and uh, Paul Levitz for listening to her kept pushing that rate up over time and Shelly Bond really championed my rate ah, and it got to be a good a pretty good rate page rate and I went back uh this couple of years ago I always say last year but with the pandemic I don't know might have been four years ago um, <laughs> either you. yesterday or five years or ago, five years ago. <laughs> uh, but I did a, a Superman story for the Superman blue and red series uh wow. 
editor Jamie Rich was like, you can do whatever you want, which is my favorite thing to hear for a comic. And uh, so I did a story and he called me. He's like, I'm really trying to fight to get you your rate. And I'm like, my rate from 10 or 12 years ago, the last time I worked there. Yeah, they don't they don't pay anything like that now. Wow. You know, it's like so it, it had and I know people in the industry, so I know what it's gone down to. But it didn't go up as the economy went up and as, you know, fake Bitcoin money came in and <laughs> business boomed and cover prices went up writer rates went down and the right the rate that i was told was almost half of what i used to make monthly on my stuff and i'm like well i'm not going to work for that i'll just do my own thing over at image uh and so they got me my rate but it was my rate from 10 years ago jesus that's insane what and i'm sorry i missed your story tell me what your uh what your story was for that uh, series uh, i worked with somebody named duncan rulo uh, Heard of who, who drew it uh, and I, during the pandemic, uh, my wife and I, Liesl, uh, took in two foster kids and then we adopted those kids wow. uh, about a year ago. And, uh, it really gave us something to do during the pandemic. Cause we're old and they're older. They were nine and uh, 16 when they came, That's but, great. Uh, but we're still <laughs> like, we're old. So it was like a lot to keep track of, even if you couldn't leave the house or talk to anybody. But, uh, so when Jamie said, you can do whatever you want, I was thinking about, foster kids, which is what Superman is, essentially. Yes. And so I wrote a, a story about Martha uh, kind of responding to the the talk around town about her new foster kid and how, you know, that kid is her kid. It's not some rando. Wow. So it, it turned out pretty well. I really liked it. Duncan did a beautiful job on the art. Uh, and I always like experimental stories and forms and coloring and whatever. So that was that was fun for me to do. The only other Superman stuff I had done was the Vertigo. It's a bird book, which I still love and stand by. And then a run on Superman uh, after that, even though it, people think I did that before because the It's a Bird Vertigo book came out after. Of course. No, I remember both. And I, in fact, I'll pop up a couple uh, examples of images. They re-released. Um, well, first of all, we should talk about your Superman run. And there's the 10 cent adventure, which. Yeah, I mean, so this came after It's a Bird, but It's oh, a Bird. I wrote yeah. It's a Bird First, which is a book for people who don't know about how much I don't like Superman. And uh, I talked Paul Levitz, I talked Karen into asking Paul if I could do it. And then I talked Paul into doing it via a letter, which is a story of its own uh, stuff. But it's a, a book about uh, how I, as a kid, was given superhero comics. I did not like them. And the reason why is because Huntington's disease runs in my family. And to my mind, you know, genes and, and extra abilities were a negative thing. Uh, and so the idea of a super being didn't make any sense. Like the people in my family who had something extra, it was killing them. Uh, so I just didn't gravitate towards superheroes and 20 short stories about Superman all told in different art styles, which is why Teddy Christensen, the artist got an Eisner cause he worked his butt off, uh, that explained to me why Superman is the superior hero and what's cool about him in a myriad of ways. And so those short stories interrupt this ongoing narrative of me not wanting to write Superman, but agreeing to write Superman uh, after my fictional editor in the comic is telling me, what the hell is wrong with you? He's the top superhero. I'm like, not for me, buddy. Uh, so I wrote that first, and that was kind of all I had to say about Superman. Okay. And then before that book had come out, uh, Eddie Berganza, who was editing the Superman titles with all three of my Man of Action friends working on them, Yes. Asked, me, asked me a couple times if I wanted to write Superman. I'm like, nope, I got nothing to say. I got nothing to do. Uh, and eventually he talked me into it partly because I needed insurance and my uh, monthlies at DC had ended. So I had to do something. And partly because I was like, you know what? I can do this. I wrote a whole book about how great he is. Uh, and then I found it just taxing and challenging. And uh, poor Scott McDaniel, I think, would have loved for me to take a hike after a month or two. But I had to do a year. So, yeah. I, I thought it was good, I and I also loved what uh, J the Joes did as well, Kelly and Casey. Yeah, they had been on it a long time, and I was excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to go back, because we'd all done the X-Men together, and I was like, okay, well, we'll, yeah. we'll get that magic back, which, you know, that was, I don't know if magic is the word, but uh, the day we started the first summit when I became a writer of Superman, uh, Dan DiDio came in, and he's like, the Superman movie just fell apart with Brett Ratner. We don't want anything happening on these books this year. We don't want to draw any attention to these things because it can mess up the next movie setup. And I'm like, did I sign up for Superman literally the day nothing can happen? <laughs> and the answer was, I did. So what so. was your solution to that uh, premise? 
Well, you read it. <laughs> I mean, I just it's been a while, but re remind I just me said I'm, I'm, I decided I, that, you know, there's the super and the man. So which way do you go? Well, it's a bird is the man for the most part. So I said, I'm going to go science. I'm just going to go all super, go weird science. Uh, and I did what I could within the constrict constraints that we had. Okay. All right. I, you know, again, this is, by the way, everybody, this is the new cover. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, that's uh, the current, current edition with, uh, it also has a little two page short story that we did for Superman, Batman 75 called it's a bat, uh, which is a comedic somewhat sequel to that book. Not that there ever should, or would be a sequel to that book. <laughs> Someone in the chat asked, and I was going to ask anyway, so I'm acknowledging the question, but also I, I want to ask myself, where's Teddy Chris Krigstein? I mean, uh, this, he, he had such a big splash. Are, you know, are we missing his stuff? Is he overseas? What's going on with him? Well, so Teddy, I love Teddy to death. I see him because I teach at a school in Denmark where Teddy lives. So I have wow. been able to drop in on him uh, even over the past two years uh, when the pandemic eased off a little bit. So there's a lot with Teddy Christensen. One, he's been doing these super cute children's books in Denmark uh, that are just gorgeous. They're not in English. So if you want to Google Translate or whatever, uh, they're worth looking up. You just Google him and put in children's books. It'll probably show up. Beautiful cool. art worth looking at. Two, we have all the rights to House of Secrets back, except we have can't call it House of Secrets, obviously. Sure. Uh, the Vertigo book that we did together. So yes. we are literally minutes away from choosing the new title for that. And then we will announce some stuff that we will do with and for that uh, property slash project slash creative love of ours. Three, he and I have been working on a new book uh, for 10 years. It's a bear. It's a weird one because... Uh, what we've been doing since It's a Bird was It's a Bird is a biography. Then we do an experimental book. Then we do a biography. The next one was Genius. Then we do an experimental book. That one was uh, Red Diary after that one. Okay. So the next book is another experimental book. And it's such a bizarre experiment that it's just, it's taking forever. But it's going to be cool. Uh, we're calling it right now Mercury. We have no idea what it will be called because we don't know what it's about. Neither one of us. Uh, <laughs> because the work process is that Teddy is painting 240 rectangular images from a narrative that he's imagining in his head. And I get these 240 images when they're done out of sequence, like a jigsaw puzzle. And I'm going to sequence those and then write a script. And then that will be the book. So whatever he's got in mind is not the book. I don't have anything in mind because I have no idea what he's drawing. And we, neither one of us knows what the order of the book will be. And then in this weird frenzy, some book will come into being that neither one of us knew we were working on. <laughs> That sounds, hey man, that sounds great. It sounds appropriately experimental. Yeah, um, so he's got 130 some images done of 240. So we're, but we're moving much faster than we have been. That's what I Okay. Well, even, even the re release of whatever you guys decide House of Secrets will be called, you know, this is a great excuse for us to talk again when that time comes. Sure. But also, um, I, uh, are you, are there other Vertigo creator owned stuff? Uh, that was under the Vertigo imprint that has reverted back to you and you can do what you want with it. Yes, I have American Virgin with uh, Becky Cloonan and other sure. talented people. I have Vertigo with Mike Allred. That was a one shot that we did. I already republished the Crusades with Kelly Jones. Of uh, course, uh, yes. Yeah, Image Comics with my new most beloved home. Uh, Sam and Mystery Theater, you know, ugh, I don't know. If, Okay. Yeah, new uh, new volume, man. I I, uh, I pulled up one of my favorite covers. Yeah, a new the, the fat one. collection of stuff, which is quite awesome. Uh, you know, it's never been fully collected. There's supposed to be a second volume uh, coming out soon. I'm looking up one thing that I'm trying. To... Oh yeah, of course, the CMYK books. I don't have any control over those, or Flinch, or the other stuff that I did there. Okay. But all the creator-owned books that I had, one at a time, over many many years, I've managed to get them all back. Uh, and I'm just trying to decide, you know, which which way am I going with all that? What am I doing? Uh, yeah, well, that's great. And honestly, again, because they were so unique, uh, you know, you can turn them on to a new audience and it's, you know, it's new to them. I mean, and I think that's wonderful, man. It is. And it's it's uh, one of the best things about comics is that, you know, I, I haven't done a convention in probably four years because of the pandemic and the adoption and whatever. I'm hoping to put my foot back in that soon. Great. Um, but uh, what I love is that I used to be like whatever book you had out, that's what you were promoting. And if, that, if you didn't have a new book, why bother? And now it really is that Kafka, which is the first thing I did, I put back out through image. And 
people come up and that's that's their first book by me and they've never heard of it you know and so i have to really just keep a mindset of oh okay you come to this stuff whenever you come to it and it's you know i try to make things that are not specifically temporal unless they are a period piece um but uh stuff lasts if you make it you know Ab fairly absolutely well. absolutely man no it, and by the way the house of secrets makes a little appearance in the latest shelly bond kickstarter book she's doing her trifecta of uh, editorial volumes that are both yeah. biography and creative uh, uh encyclopedia and uh we did a three or four page story that has rain and one of the the jurist's faults uh, talking about Shelley's secrets. Uh, so hunt that down. That's fantastic. I, you know, seriously, man, especially during the pandemic, I really got to know Shelley that much better. And, uh, we, we really have parallel lives in terms of she was a college radio person. Um, I was a college radio person and we're, you know, at that same age and everything. So we're, uh, you know, we're very simpatico with a lot of things. I hope I didn't uh, call her out by referring to the fact she's slightly younger. All right, let's put she's it back. A slightly younger than me. Slightly. <laughs> slightly. No, I, this, I've known Shelly almost uh, as long as I've been in comics because uh, I did the book for Dinny at Renegade. Then I did the Amazon with Tim Sale at Kamiko. And then my third project was slated to be this book with Mike Allred called Jaguar Stories that Shelly was editing for their Keyline Books line, a 12 issue maxi series uh, that has never seen the light of day. What's done of it? We're always talking about ways to make that something. I think I have a new idea that I might uh, try to do. But uh, yeah, Shelly Shelly is that long ago in my my atlas. I hear you, man. I was uh, also a maid of honor at her wedding. So, oh, that's great! Yeah. Wow, at at her wedding, at, at with her and at her her wedding to Philip. Yes, yeah. I, I told her I want to go in the women's bathroom because I've never been in there. So she made me her maid of honor because I'd have to carry her little train behind her as she went in. Uh, and you know what? It's pretty much the same, just no urinals. But they, but they got a, usually in the good ones. They have a place to sit down. Not that I frequent women. It was a lot cleaner. It was a okay. lot cleaner. That's but true that's too. Probably just because women are more careful. Of course, indeed. <laughs> Who knew we were going to talk about this? That's a fantastic subject. You know, uh, I, I Scorpio is there in the the comments. He's saying, yes. uh, "I'd love to have people tell everyone about get naked." But I got to tell you, if I write a book called Get Naked, of course I'm going to talk about urinals uh, on your podcast. So I respect that. I absolutely, man. Um, well, you've opened the can by, by acknowledging Scorpio's uh, question about that. Do you want to talk about Get Naked? Uh, I certainly can. I pulled it down because I saw the question. What? All right, zooming in. Yes. There it is. This is a collection of essays, comic book essays, uh, about me specifically. God help us getting naked. Uh, but it's um, I love I love essays. I love the form. I love Spalding Gray's performance essays, performance monologues that he did. Definitely love David Sedaris, who's made a whole career out of writing essays and then reading essays. And the reason that you and I know each other kind of is because Lisa was teaching speech uh, right. at College of Page because we were we met on our college speech team at the University of Colorado, which yeah. is where I know Scorpio from. Uh, shout out to Colorado and Boulder specifically. And um, I I have not really ever performed per se. I did the whole time I was on speech team, speech and debate in college. That's all I did. I traveled. Then I coached a team and I watched other people perform and I was, you know, missing it at some point. I was like, I'd like to get out there and read some, some stuff again. And I was thinking about what I should do is mix what I do, comic books and this kind of performative essay stuff, these kind of comedy stories. And uh, I was, I just played around in Photoshop going, what would an essay comic book be like without the text, which there would be more of trashing the art? Cause I hate text heavy comics that are too much text. <laughs> And I could not for the life of me get anything that worked. Like it all just looked like, you know, pictures with text bothering it. And uh, I teach at the school, as I mentioned in Denmark, called the Animation Workshop. Uh, Teddy got me in the door there and I've been lucky to go back for each class that they get every two years, new students. And so I talked to one of the professor's coordinators there and I said, you know, how about we do an exercise where I make it an assignment for your students to figure out what a comic book essay looks like? Because uh, I sure can't. And they draw them. We'll do it like a workshop where in 10 days, they each do a 10 page story adapting one of these essays that I write. And if it's good, we'll publish it through image. And if it's bad, we'll just say it was an assignment. And uh, they were like, we're, we'll do it. So I was like, okay, well, shit, now I got to write 19 essays, uh, <laughs> which I had not written essays before, though I like them. It's a different form. So sure, sure. I was hustling to figure out like, what is this going to be about? 
And I was like, well, okay, it's not going to sell because it's essays and it's comic books. So it's either got to have the word sex, naked, or gun in the title. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do guns. So I don't have any gun stories, really. I'm not going to do my sex stories because, A, no one wants to hear about that. And, B, I don't want to <laughs> talk about that. Maybe I do. Maybe when I'm old. Uh, I got some good ones. But um, boy. then I was like, well, I can't do naked because I'm just never naked anywhere. Uh, oh, except that one time in Germany. I was like, oh, and except that, and except for Korea. And, except, and what I realized was that anytime I leave the U.S., I seem to be naked uh, against my will mostly, but it turns out okay. And when I'm in the U.S., I'm not. And so that became the thing. I was like, okay, well, I want to write essays about what's going on in the U.S. That when you're not in the U.S., you and everybody else can be naked, alone or together or whatever. And in the U.S., this country just dominated by sex and sexuality and violence, a nude body went from being this thing that was fine to absolutely not. Yes. Uh, and I, I found some, some uh, stuff online about how swimming in high school used to be nude for men. Yes. Like public high schools and the YMCA and gyms and whatever, you just take off your clothes, jump in the pool with all your classmates, swim for an hour, the gym teacher would hand you a towel and off you'd go. Yep, and sure. I was like, I heard about that when I was in high school, when yeah. I was in junior high, people were always like, you gotta be naked in swim class, you gotta be naked in swim class. And then when I got there, nobody was naked in swim class. And I was like, thank God, cause I can't I even swim, let alone be naked. <laughs> and so the more I looked into that, the more it was like, well, that is true for broad swaths of the country what the hell happened? Like, what corner do we turn? So these essays are about that shift and kind of the global alternative to that. Uh, and the students at the animation workshop, there are 19 of them, or I'd name them by name, uh, killed it. They were amazing. Like, they solved what a comic book essay looks like 19 different ways. Like, I couldn't figure out one, and they came up with 19 totally different ways to do it. Uh, and I showed it to Eric Stevens. He's like, yeah, we'll publish this. I'm like, hallelujah. And they did. And then it got two Eisner nominations. I never win. Never. Uh, so I knew I wouldn't win. And I didn't. But uh, it was, it's an honor to be nominated. Yeah, that's I. I but I uh, that happened to me. I got nominated for a Chicago Emmy and did not win. So I understand that the swimming thing, much like you, thank God, we're of that <laughs> generation that was allowed to have suits. But yeah, everyone I know that was older is like, oh, yeah, we swam, we swam naked all the time. And it's like, wow. Yeah, but it's really I, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I, I swam naked in Berlin. There's a, okay. I, I have a, a mild heart condition, so I have to swim every day, which is funny because I could not swim until I was 30. Wow. But when I was told I have to run or swim every day and I ran for a week, I was like, okay, time to learn how to swim because there's running. I'm so, so with you, dude. Swimming is low impact. It's yeah. fun. Steve, as, as a guy who's written his share of Superman and even it's a bird, I feel like I'm flying when I'm swimming. I really do. I well, I'm still terrified of water because up until I was 30, because I couldn't swim, I assumed I would drown if I got in a pool. Uh, and I still, I swam today. I swim every day. Good. I swam today. When I get into the pool, I literally go, "Don't drown." That's the first thing oh, I think. Uh, but then I start swimming. I love it. And okay, um, good. But I, I swam in a pool in Berlin because I had just gotten this diagnosis where I was like, I got to swim all the time. And they sent me to a rooftop kind of spa with a swimming pool thing. And I had not been to many spas, let alone one in Germany. And it, everybody was just naked. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to swim in this pool naked. Okay, well, I've gotten over that. I did that part. What I didn't understand was that the pool on the roof went from inside to outside. Oh no. And so I'm, I'm doing the backstroke and then I'm like, my dick is out and everyone in these office buildings is looking at it, uh, which they were not, of course, no one cares. Uh, what makes you think they needed binoculars? Um, but uh so that story is in the book and a bunch of other ones um, about just random places I got naked. That's outstanding. You know, um, Mr. Skin of Internet fame is a regular guest here at Word Balloon. And honestly, I, 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 you know, it's so easy to go into Morning Zoo, just, you know, hey, look at that girl, hey, whatever. But honestly, what, what I really, and it's great because he appreciates it. I'm like, isn't it interesting that movies have gotten so much more conservative, yet streaming television and cable? Anything goes. Good Lord. I saw the debut of um, Lily Rose Depp's uh, show, The Idol, on HBO mm -hmm. on Sunday. And, and and of course, Euphoria preceding it. And, of course, same creator as Euphoria. And it's like, wow, man, that's amazing of, of, of how the mores have changed from film to television. And, yeah, it seems like television. Yeah, but, you know, working on Sam and Mystery Theater with Guy Davis, uh, you know, we did a ton of research. And one of the things that came up was how much porn there was back then and how that porn 
was really similar to the porn we have now, like the camera angles, the subject matter, the choice. It's the same shit we have now. So we pretend like, oh, this never happened. It happened all the time. It's always the same. And so I started wondering about that over the course of working on this book in particular. And I didn't really address this in there. But I think what it boils down to is that in a patriarchal society, male driven, we, we don't mind naked women, naked women all day long, naked women in the park, naked, 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 whatever. It's the penis that we're like, oh, my God, I don't want to see one of those. I've got one, but I don't want to see another one. And it's like that phobia seems to be the linchpin of all of this. There can't be equality because we don't want to see a penis. We don't mind seeing women, but we can't see women because we don't want to see men. And we don't want to pretend like there's a double standard, but there's a giant double standard. Uh, it's the same thing on television. You know, euphoria, naked women, wall, floor, to, floor to ceiling, wall to wall. I don't know what I'm trying to say there. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there's a penis shown on there. So, like, oh, my gosh, what are they doing to television? It's well, ridiculous. Yeah. Then you go to Germany and you swim naked in a co-ed facility where it's men, women, kids, grandpas. <laughs> Or you go to a Korean spa where it's grandma, grandpa, you know, segregated, but whatever. And in about three minutes, you go, this doesn't matter. This is a false thing. Because like I said, I'm a, I, nobody wants to see me naked. They shouldn't. But I could care less now. And it took about three minutes. That's great, man. Well, you know, ironically, there was another HBO show a while ago. And I don't remember the title, but the conceit of the show was it was an anthology show. And you followed this, I want to say, New York pot dealer. And and I do remember seeing some uh, crank on on that show, some male some male frontal nudity, and I'm like, oh, all right, you know what? And again, my just like you said, it's like, well, you know, we see women all the time. All right, fine, whatever. It didn't offend me or anything like that. So it is weird. Oh, hey, look who's watching, bud. It's uh, Nick Burrus. Nick, thank I'm, you. I'm secretly doing a thing for Nick. I can't talk about it. I don't think. Thank you, man. No, and he said, <laughs> the best guess. well, that's very nice, Nick. Thank you. And he's telling everyone to like and uh, hit the thumbs up. Yay. Um, hey, everybody, time. listen, I and I've, I've only really inst institute made it this part of the show recently. Um, you know, it's uh, it's just a weird financial time. I mean, it is. And um, so if you can, if you have a question, please, uh, please hit that uh, stream. Here's what I want to do, John, because you got this new thing going. I... I Everything I do is like fans matter the most. That's my my philosophy. So because this is new and because I'm here, if any of these people have questions that have not tipped you, you go ahead and ask those questions and I'll pay their tip. Oh, Steve. That's, I don't care. I don't, well, I don't want anybody feeling left out of this convo. These are very nice. kind, Steve. That's very sweet. I, I That's very, very try nice. Try to find me when this thing's over. No, no, no. <laughs> no <I'm> <laughs> well... Uh, well, here, wait, excuse me. It was uh, Greg that we wanted to pop up then. He wanted to know what your uh, working relationship with Dave Johnson was on Ben 10. He loves his designs. I didn't know Dave was working for you guys on Ben 10. Well, that was, uh, it was quite a while ago. Ben 10 is about 15 years old at this point. And Dave True. was, yes. he, after Duncan, who did the original, original designs, Dave did the actual original designs when the show went into production. And Dave oh, is wow. a genius. We all know that. Uh, one of the best cover artists working, one of the best just graphic designers in general. That is not Dave's art. So sorry, uh, that's Dave. Also, it's also good art, but just to not confuse anybody. Um, but <laughs> Dave, Dave did an amazing job. I will tell you this, though, that Dave is the reason my poker game ended. Uh, I had a slight, you know, low stakes, low testosterone poker game uh, for comic book people in my neighborhood for a while. And uh, Dave Johnson heard about it. He's like, I want to come to that game. We're like, yeah, come on. And he came over and destroyed us. Like he just like it was a just a penny ante kind of game. And he wanted all the pennies, speaking of getting all the money. And I was like, I don't know if I can have this game again because Dave will just take all of our money and all of our joy. I <laughs> said so I canceled the game instead of having again because I was so offended by what a good poker player he was. Uh, but no, he's he's a lovely person, uh, and an astonishing talent who deserves all the praise he can get. One uh, another one of my favorite people in comics. I always love seeing David at shows and stuff. And that's truly, man, uh, you know, thank God we are getting out of COVID. Although now, good Lord, the East Coast, you and I are lucky beyond me in the Midwest and you on the West Coast. I was in meetings all day with Joe Kelly and all he kept saying was, is your sky red? Is this crisis on infinite earths? He didn't yeah. say that, but I knew that people might like the comic reference. No, I hear you, man. Uh, oh, Nick is asking why I don't have these super chats set up. You know, Nick, I did. And all of a sudden YouTube uh, took it away from me. And I'm not sure why. I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. In the meantime, I'm using streaming elements, which people can use via PayPal and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> Nick has been very kind 
and uh, tip me in the past. And I, I do appreciate that. So no, and really, Steve, that's 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 really generous. I don't, and I and I. Oh, and no, I happy. Happy well, you. you might have been talking when I said I'm doing a secret project for Nick that I can't mention, but I am. No, I heard you say that. Absolutely. Okay, you didn't. Awesome. You didn't react at all. You were just like, eh. oh no. Well, I figured I didn't. I didn't want to tip anything. And I, when I say tip, I don't mean pay. But, uh, but no. Wait, I, Nick, I, Nick may not know about it. It's already set up, Nick. We're good. Wow. Excellent. There you go. Uh, and he said, yeah, get it set up. Absolutely. That's great. <laughs> no, seriously, man. Nick, thank you. are going to work tomorrow and go, who the hell is working with Siegel? Cancel that thing. No, no. And he, yeah, he says, I'm honored to be working with Steven. Hey, Aww, man. It's uh, truly, yeah. Oh, and he says, trust me, I know that it's set up. <laughs> Good deal. Well, that's good. I'm excited to see what you guys might have uh, cooking and everything. Yeah, it'll be it'll be unexpected for sure. Is it a without going into detail? Is it an original thing or is it a license? I'm product? not going to answer any more questions. See, there you go. He well, I mean, I'll answer more questions. Not that question. Not that question. Fair enough, man. Are we? Well, okay. I was going to say, how far are we away from an announcement? But I guess that's between you and Nick. Might be, and uh, and maybe others. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. He says, I keep asking uh, Matt once every week. Uh -oh. I know, and Matt asks us every day. So it is it is just us who is slow, not Matt. No problem. I And then truly, man, I'm so glad that you are, you know, doing actively doing comics again. Because that was my wonder to a degree. In because really, you came, you came, you watched me talking to Shelly and Diana Schutz a couple months ago, which oh, was yeah. great. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, what's Steve doing? So it is really great to hear that you're doing new things and also you have control over uh what you're you know oh yeah out there yeah I'm, I'm, you're doing, uh, I'm doing a book with an artist in argentina named fernando calvi uh that we haven't announced and we won't announce till we're much farther along uh that's an original uh you know i haven't figured out a time frame in which uh becky and i can figure out what to do with american virgin but controlling it is great like that book was canceled at 23 but it was supposed to go to 24 Right. So now if we decide to, we can just do 24 and make that thing complete or just do new miniseries. But he had some thoughts about that that were cool. Uh, so it's it's really just timing and figuring that stuff out. House of Secrets, I would love to do a lot with when it's not called that anymore. That was yeah. I licensed the title from D.C. for a dollar, by the way. So they're not being evil. It always said in my contract that I couldn't uh, keep the title when I went away. So that all makes sense. Uh, perfectly fine. And uh, and the new book with Teddy, you know, I did two Camp Midnight books with Jason Katzenstein. And we may get back to that someday as well. We have a third story in mind, but uh, he's too talented for me at the moment. But maybe I'll lure him back. I love to do comics. I can't wait to do more comics. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it wasn't for lack of interest. It really was adopting kids and a pandemic was a lot on top of the man of action work. That's excellent, man. Hey, uh, Scorpio Steel uh, just uh, donated, and that's very kind, man. Nice. See, I'm not, uh, you know, hey, man, I'm not asking for a ton. I, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a small amount, and I genuinely appreciate it, man. Um, oh, that's nice. And uh, Wesley says also the War Balloon Patreon. Once you get set up for the one dollar default, you can charge it, change it to a higher end amount. And a lot of people have been doing that, and it's very kind. Everyone's really nice. God, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm Jerry Lewis running the telethon right now. <laughs> So. Wesley also was asking about the red diary. Yes. I have, I have all my books up here, but uh, for people who don't know, it was, it was a Danish graphic novel. This Damn is right. actually the, the legit deal. And Teddy sent it to me and I was, it was gorgeous. Like it's just a beautiful, oh, I love being on camera. It's like, Attaboy, you look good. Page, it'll be beautiful. Oh, stand by. I'll open it up again. Wow. We'll, we'll let people see. Beautiful. Beautifully painted, you know, whatever. And he was like, uh, do you think Image would publish it? I'm like, yeah, you got to translate it. He's like, you should translate it. I'm like, I do not speak Danish, so no. <laughs> uh, and he's like, well, I don't think I would do a good job of it. So I'm like, Mwah. and I had it. I just kept looking at it, looking at it, going, I wonder what this thing's about. Uh, and so I started imagining what it was about. And then I started making up what it was about. And then I wrote to Teddy and I said, how about I translate it guessing? Like, I'm just going to guess what I think is happening here because I think I got it after looking at it for two years. And he's like, oh yeah, that sound, sounds good, which is not a good idea. So I'm surprised he thought that sounded like a good idea. And uh, I did. So what I did was I took his book and I literally kept everything where it is and anywhere he had a word balloon, I put the same length of a word balloon and anywhere he'd use like the word Paris, I would use the word Paris. So if there was a word that you know made sense or a year or whatever, sure. I would 
take that and I would put it in and then I would just make up the rest of it, like a similarly count word count kind of thing. And I guessed what the book was about and wrote all that up. And then I sent it to Teddy. I'm like, here's what your book is about. And then he wrote back. He's like, that's not at all what my book is. And then he sent me a translation that he did. And I was like, oh my God, these are like wildly different. Like your main character is not even my main character. And I'm not even in the right year, even though I thought I was. And uh, yeah, so like that's World War One. Basically. Yeah, so we published that. It's a flip book. It's got his on one side. I cleaned up his transition using Google Translate, which was really good, actually. And then uh, the other version with the same pages in the same order and the same word balloons, but a totally different story. Uh, and that was our last crazy experiment, Wesley. Uh, it was fun. It was also unnerving because there were there were some pages at the end that had a totally different format. And I'm like, I was done with my kind of, here's what I think it is. And I'm like, what about these pages? Uh, and so just trying to solve that. And uh, I'm doing another book that's an even weirder extension of that uh, after I get done with the, the Teddy book, um, or maybe during, I don't know, uh, that I can't talk about yet, but soon. That's that's incredible, man. You know, it reminds me, I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a Batman manga called City of Dreams mm -hmm. that was translated uh, by, uh, and now suddenly the name escapes me. Um, oh, it was uh, Max Allen Collins. Yeah. And essentially the same thing happened. He really just took the images and wrote his own story and everything. I don't, I yeah. don't know if you ever heard what uh, Kia, and I forget it, how to say yes, it. Sama or something like that? I can't remember. Like that. Yeah, I don't know. I never heard a response from him, but I'm glad. That sounds great that you and Teddy were able to come up with this. That's great. Well, you know, I what I, ta I, I, I have a writer's group that we don't read each other's work. We just sit and write all day at a Korean spa in LA. Been doing it for 12 years, once a week. And one of the things I do talk about with new writers who show up is just to say, there are so many ways to get at this. Like, there are, how do you write a comic book? Well, you know, everybody has their little system, but I try to not. I try to have a new system for each project because once you get your toolbox where you're like, I understand theme, I understand character, I understand pacing, I know how to write to visual storytelling and how to not overwrite for it because the pictures do most of the work, you know, then there are other ways to get at it. Like, I don't need to give Teddy a script for us to come up with a cool comic. He can just start drawing and I can make something out of that. Or he can make a comic and I can make something else out of that. Or I can write him a full script or I can write uh, an outline and he can do that. And I can, like with Guy Davis, I wrote all the dialogue after Guy had drawn from a matte plot most of the time. So, you know, I saw a lot of stuff in the acting that his characters did on the page and I knew what the setup was, but I never had any idea what they were going to be talking about until I looked at them and said, they must be talking about their relationship on the skids or whatever. And that all came from just visual cues. The guy, not knowing what the dialogue would be, was putting in and not, he didn't write me and go, they're talking about their relationship, right? It was just a trust of people using their skills to make comics. And there's a million different ways to get there. But every time you go to one of these panels, it's like, here's exactly how you, it's like, no, there's no exactly. Uh, and different artists need different things too. Like I can't draw, I wish I could, but I can't. So when I work with artists, I'm like, what do you want out of a script? Because that's the person the script is for. So if Teddy, for example, likes a full script with everything explained most of the time, but he can also get tired of that. So House of Secrets was him saying, I wish every story arc was different. And I said, well, okay, it will be. And the scripts will be different. We'll change the form of the scripts so that you're not always dealing with the same kind of schematic to get there. Yeah. Uh, and that stuff can go up in flames and some of my stuff does, but it can also get you something that nobody else does, which is what my stuff usually does, hopefully. That's really incredible, man. And I really want to get into uh, Sandman Mystery Theater, and you've already opened the door explaining that. So is that, um? because I wondered how you guys were dividing stories. And I've talked to Matt about what he did, but it's great to talk to you as well. First of all, and, if, and really, if anyone watching, and I'm so glad that the new uh, Big Omnibus is out there, because, yeah, man, I know, I don't want to give you a, I want to give you a hernia. Look at that dictionary size, man. Jesus Christ. Definitely That's half good. of it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad they're doing that because truly I bought the issues back in the day, but I didn't keep them. And I'm like, God, I really miss those stories. And it's Wesley Dodds. Year, I mean, it's DC Heroes year one. And Wesley, I, I love the idea. And, and please tell me how much of it was mad. And I want to hear your involvement. But the idea that Wesley Dodds, this guy who was in the justice society and originally had the gas mask and the uh and and the cloak and the hat but then uh transitioned into a more 
traditional looking um, superhero when Simon and Kirby were doing their Sandman stuff, but it was that original creator. And um, it seemed like your, your guys' stories were based on his first 10 stories. You guys have expanded them into five or six issue arcs, but essentially it was these first 10, they were 10 page stories essentially in adventure comics or whichever one they were originally hosted in. So it, I loved it because it really was like, you know, originally Golden Age Superman was the first hero and stuff. Uh, but I really like this idea of, well, if it wasn't, you know, him, you had Dr. Occult, you had Sandman, you had uh, Slam Bradley, these characters that were adventurers, but really weren't superheroes per se. So so tell me how you got involved and, and you know, what you feel you contributed to to these amazing stories. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, first I know, of all, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> Leandro, Leandro hooked us up that it's Kia Asamiya. So yes, indeed. Yes, thank you, man. Uh, thanks for that. But yeah, um, for the uh, Batman City of Dreams. Yeah, so if if you've read the Sandman, Neil Gaiman Sandman, or watched the TV show, you know Sandman is imprisoned. Spoiler alert for a uh, hundred years, I think, uh, in a, a glass ball. And Matt's idea was during the time that he's imprisoned, that dream energy funnels itself into San Wesley Dodds. Uh, who then has these dreams that just compel him to go out in this gas mask, which looks kind of like the Morpheus mask, and gas people and right wrongs. You know, so it's kind of like a weird psychosis, sleep deprivation kind of combo thing. So that's that's our story: is that the Sandman channels this kind of idea from Morpheus uh, and doesn't know what to do with it or how to act on it. He's not really a hero. He's kind of you know slightly overweight, like all of us. He he doesn't work out because the thirties and that wasn't so much. Yeah, he's this dumpy. He's this dumpy little guy. Go yeah, on. Yeah, and so he goes out to kick ass, but he often gets his own ass kicked because what the hell is he doing? But he can't stop. He's compelled. Uh, and so Matt did a year of that with Guy Davis on the first arc, R.G. Taylor, and uh, uh, oh, I just had it and I just blew it. But I've got a book. Stand by. Stand by because it's right here. And I, it's odd that I get John Watkiss, of course. Jesus. Oh sure. I just talked about him in another podcast two weeks ago, and I'm suddenly blanking. That's how my brain is now, so apologies. It's all good, man. I'm doing the same thing. Don't sweat it. Uh, he did those three arcs, and then he wanted to go back to Mage. And so he told Karen, he's like, I got to quit this book because I got to go back to Mage. She's like, don't quit. Get a co-writer. And for whatever reason, he called me up, which I had done one Grindle Tale story for him on Grindle 40, and that's it. And we had met maybe once or twice when he was on tour places. We were not lifelong pals or anything, uh, but... I was stunned. I was like, why is he calling me? And I had already been to DC and gotten Primal Force, which uh, I think Steven was mentioning, Indeed. Uh, and some other stuff set up. And I was like, I don't have time for this. Matt's really talented, but he's super, he's going to be a hothead. He's going to be very bossy, and we are I'm very bossy, and it's not going to work out. And he's like, hey, just fly up to Portland, and we'll talk about it. It's like, well, I do like his cooking, and I Portland sounds fun. <laughs> so I went up there, and literally over the course of dinner, we we were just figuring out the next year, like his his uh, Jedi mind trick was not to ask how we would work. It was literally to just start working, which we did. And it was seamless. And we never, we never had even, I was, I was just visiting him a week ago. I was at a wedding up in Portland and he made me lunch and it was so good. Um, but uh, we didn't, we didn't have a speed bump even. Like we didn't have a disagreement about a plot point ever. It's so weird. Uh, cause you would think that headstrong creators would, butt, but we did not, uh, it was just really easy from the get go. So my job when I came on at number 13 was to, to do dialogue. So Matt would do the plot okay. the guy would lay it out. I would write the dialogue. It would be lettered. Uh, and then the guy would ink it up and that was it. That was the first year. Then Matt's like, ah, oh, I did another year of this two years. I got to get off of this thing. And I'm like, no, I'll work with you on the plots. So we did the plots, same process, whatever. And he's like, ah, three years is too long in the tooth. I got to go. And I'm like, nope, you give me a paragraph uh, and I'll turn that into a, a page for each part of the, you know, so it's just how can I hang on to Matt as long as I possibly can? And then the fifth year, he's like, I'm out of here. Uh, <laughs> there, was, there was no holding on to him. And then the book was canceled. So there you go. Wow. And that, man, I am telling you, truly one of my absolute favorite Vertigo series. And I've told Matt this as well. And I really loved that there was a vertigo bent on DC's golden age. And, and Matt told me, he's like, I didn't ask for permission. I just did what I want. Fuck them. <laughs> you know? And it's yeah, like, and 
we, we both had people who dug it like you. And then we had people who would write in and be like, you're really disrespecting them. And it's like, no, like these stories, we read the other stories. We contextualize them. This is a street level crime comic. So if we're going to have the Simon Kirby Sandman costume, it needs to be at a New Year's, you know, uh, masquerade ball where people are costumed because that's not part of this world. But we will acknowledge it and we will say it existed at the time. You know, the Phantom of the World's Fair, Sandman was in DC's World's Fair comics in 1939. Yes. We just said that the Phantom was a serial killer and showed you what they couldn't show you in 1939. So it, it was highly respectful of the stuff because we wanted it to fit right in. We didn't want to piss on everything. It was the opposite. No, I loved it, man. I, I loved, uh, as you know, I acknowledged one of my favorite covers and one of my favorite stories was the Hour Man story. Yeah. And then also, um, also when you, you guys introduced the Crimson Avenger mm -hmm. coming in. Who, when the book was canceled early, you know, it was, it, it was always four issue arcs. And okay. I kept asking him, like, our sales are bad. Are we being canceled? No, 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 you're not being canceled. Are we being canceled? No, no, no. And I was just like really just doing four issues. And I, I at the end there, I was like, okay, there's no way these sales are going to keep us going. And Karen's like, I, I haven't heard anything. I think we're fine. So I plotted out four issues. And she's like, oh, no, they're only giving us two issues to wrap it up. And I'm like, we do four. Like, this is a four issue series. It's That's what we do. For the rest of time, there's going to be missing two issues from this story. She's like, well, you just need to put it all into two. And I thought, you know what? Fuck that. I'm not going to put it into two. I'm going to have Wes and Diane leave after part two. They've got other stuff to do. They're going to hand it over to the Crimson Avenger and Burke and go, we got to go to Europe. Sorry, don't have time to solve this one. Wow. And that, that's the way the series ends. Did you write or did someone else write the um, the eventual, like, uh, when Di uh, uh, Diane Diane Belmont, right? That's that was his. He, like they were Nick and Nora Charles, basically. People, yeah. if you haven't read uh, this Sam Mystery Theater uh, series, it was amazing. But there was, I know, I because I, I know James Robinson brought Wesley back, like in his nineties. Yeah, that was actually during Sam and Mystery Theater. So at that time, James and I were very good friends, and uh, Matt obviously knew James because we had both done Grindle Tales by that point. Uh, and, uh, James just had this idea to say, what if they came to Starman and we saw what happened to them? And that seemed like a cool idea. And we said, well, what if the mist actually showed up long before Starman and we see where he came from? Yes. So we did the origin story of the mist and he did the denouement of Wes and Diane, uh, as kind of a loose crossover. They came out at the same time, but they, they aren't really a crossover. It was so good, man, and really, and maybe and it was probably John James's Starman, where Wesley's ninety and he's got somebody, someone's got him at gunpoint, and he pulls out the gas gun, and you get this great like thought bubble from from Jack saying, "My God, he's smiling," because it's yeah. like like Wesley's done this a million times, and at this point, it's like you think I'm scared of you? Fuck you! Yeah, well, Diana's won the Pulitzer Prize for literature; she became a novelist, and Wes is just kind of hanging around, so it gave him a little purpose again to do something. Absolutely. And also there was a great Lamont Crass and Margot Lane vibe. Uh, I don't know if that was in your mind, but it certainly was in mine being a, a big shadow fan. Yeah, definitely well. in Matt's original DNA. But I think we, you know, for my money, I'm terrible with mysteries. So I would care less what the mystery was. And he's like, that's fine. Some can be Columbo where we already know who did it. I was like, thank God, because uh, I'm no Agatha Christie. But I love, love, loved the idea of a romance comic wrapped in all of that. I love yeah. research. I love the 30s. I have a World's Fair bedroom in my house, so I'm like, fan of the World's Fair, fan of the World's Fair. Uh, so I was into all of that. And the idea that it shifted between four issues that, from Wes's perspective narratively and then four issues of Diane's narratively uh, back and forth over the whole run of the series was magic. You know, to be able to be in a different headspace from two different sides of a relationship as that relationship goes through weird New York City murders, crimes, whatever, what we call hate crimes now, yeah. and the blossoming of World War II uh, that was great. That was just, I couldn't ask for more fun. Honestly, man, a guy's art was so perfect. And cause he would, he would draw real people. They were, they were I, really, like, I, I mean, I, Davis can draw anything first of all. So I, I've known guys since he was at caliber cause Kafka was republished by caliber long, long, long ago. And I met him at a con. He had a giant Mohawk and I was like, this guy's scary, but he's actually one of the nicest guys <laughs> I've ever imagined. And, uh, and I asked him after probably two years on the book, he drew something. I'm like, where are you getting this research? Like I go inside of a damn power reactor control center 
and you just draw it. Like, where are you finding? He's like, I don't use any research. I'm like, what? And it's, he, he can just like, if you tell him something, he will draw it and you will believe it. And back then there was no internet to look stuff up. Sure. And he lives in a little tiny town in the middle of, uh, at the time near Detroit. And oh. it's like, it's not like there's some massive research library. He was just making it up, but he's that good at making it up. That's fantastic. And really his atmosphere was very Dashiell Hammett. I mean, it really, it really had that thirties detective vibe going on and stuff in the, the parlor room kind of uh, murders and things like uh, Lord Peter Whimsey, uh, British Dorothy Sayers, uh, the writer of Peter Whimsey. No, it had that vibe, man. And it, and it was so great. And and it really, again, it, it was so great at a time when the golden age Superman was like, no, 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 you know, we got to stick with modern Superman and they kind of eliminated earth too. And it, it really just filled in on it for me. It filled in all the, uh, all the blanks of, okay, this is what, you know, DC in the 30s or the DC universe in the 30s looked like without a Superman. And it was great. It was well, thank you. I mean, good stories are about something. So what Matt did really well was he contextualized modern problems in the past. And those problems existed. There was gay bashing back then. And we had story arcs about that. You know, there were serial killers back then. We had story arcs about that. He started with that. He was like, well, here's the kind of shock value for you. But the stories were always about how that was resonating against this relationship. So like, you know, we have a creepy baby villain and his creepy mom who turns out not to be his mom. But that's against Wes and Diane having an unplanned pregnancy. And what do you do about this baby, yeah. that might, you know, yeah. up, up in your whole life? Wow. So the stories were about real things. And we tried to make the couple seem as real as we could. And then they were still fun because they had that kind of garish, noirish kind of villain base to them. It was excellent, man. Phoenix 720 uh, didn't know about the Starman connection. He says he's uh, reading Starman for the first time. Cool to hear the connection between the characters and stories. Yeah, man. No, it's uh, Ted Knight and uh, and uh, and Wesley Dodds were friends. And it's, again, it's you, you, that wonderful scene, and I'm certain that the Sandman's there in All-Star number four, where you get the, the Justice Society in front, you know, around the round table and everything, and the Sandman's there. But it's like, this is like moments of you know, these friends and, and you get to know these people better and stuff. It's, it's great. Totally. I'm seeing Phoenix 720 asking a Ben 10 question. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, but oh, feel free. Uh, he just wanted to know if we would do another Ben 10 comic and where, cause he loved yes, the yes. Cartoon Network action pack. Uh, I actually wrote one of those cartoon network network action packs. The man of action did the first four of those. That was fun. Uh, those were great. They, those were really, really fun. That ran a long time. IDW did a Ben 10 series. Uh, they might still be doing. I can't ever keep track of where those licenses are. The uh, the interesting thing is, you know, that Ben 10 is a big franchise, so that stuff can be licensed out and done somewhere else, uh, or it can be done through whatever publishing arm Warner Brothers controls. They own Ben 10 outright, so we are attached oh. to life. We have uh, a lovely participation creatively and financially in that. So we have no angst there, but we do not control where that stuff goes. That's all controlled by the corporation as they say so i don't have an answer for you and guess what if i did i couldn't tell you the answer because i'm always signed to non-disclosure agreements that don't let me say anything of, of use am i and i'll ask the question you could either confirm or deny but i had heard that ben 10 originally started as a concept of dial h for hero that is completely false okay uh, it comes up a lot because okay. there's a watch and a phone and different heroes and whatever sure so the real origin story of Ben 10, and I, I hate to say this because I love comics, but the Man of Action guys primarily were Marvel when we were younger. Yes. So none of us knew Dial H for Hero. Legit. Wow. Didn't know about it. Sure. Uh, if we did, we would just tell you because we we wouldn't care. It's it's not similar enough that yeah. anybody could see us. No, and it is, and, it is totally it is it is different. Go yeah, on. and Warner Brothers owns DC anyway, so it wouldn't matter. So right. I, I would just both. tell you if that's what it was. There's no lawsuit there, <laughs> but it was not an influence. What it came from was uh, the short version of this because I've told the story too many times in too many places. Forgive me. Yes, the robot chicken guys came up to us when we had this table at Comic Con that we didn't know yeah. what we were doing with the third year, and they're like, hey, you guys do cartoons, don't you? And we're like, sure, even though none of us have done a cartoon. And uh, they're like, good, because Cartoon Network wants a boys action thing that's like Fantastic Four, and we don't do that, but you do. And then they you know, walked off. That was Matt Senreich. We're like, I don't know what he thinks we do, but we, we don't do that. But let's go pitch Cartoon Network anyway. And because there were four of us, and we had not worked, we had worked on the same things creatively, but we had not worked together, except on the X-Men writer's room and the, the Superman writer's room, but that's 
that's just spitballing ideas. And that's eventually what our company became. But at the time, we were all like, my idea is the good one. I want to pitch my idea. And we couldn't narrow down what we should pitch to one thing. So we pitched 20 things to Cartoon Network in 20 minutes. One minute pitches, stopwatch, bell, literally wherever you were in the pitch, we just moved on to the next one. <laughs> and we had worked on those together. So I had had a pitch called Nine uh, that was about a superhero who had a watch thing. But every time he hit it, he got another degree, bigger, stronger, whatever. And Duncan liked the watch thing, uh, but didn't like the bigger thing. He was like, oh, that's just the Hulk. And he was like, he should he should have, you know, 10 different superpowers or maybe Joe Casey. I can't even remember who did what at this yeah. point. But it was like, OK, well, there's there's some some there there. So we started kicking that around. And the initial concept was that this kid, when he hits the watch, swaps with another dimension version of himself, like a dimension of fire and he's heat blast, a dimension of gravity and he he can fly. And what? so it was different versions of Ben from different dimensions. That's kind of what Cartoon Network bought. Then they did a focus group. Uh, and said kids don't understand dimensions you know or maybe they just decided kids don't understand dimensions. <laughs> i think the multiverses of spider-man and marvel have disproved that theory kids do understand dimensions but anyway it was a different time uh so instead it, we decided okay well it's dna then so it's alien dna instead of dimensional shifts but you know the only the only hero who survived all of the kind of development that took two years as uh, accelerate. He was in the first pitch and he was in the final lineup. That's fantastic, man. Um, you know, you mentioned obviously your guys work at Marvel and you guys had a healthy run on the X-Men. Am I right? I, I saw Heidi McDonald interviewed Joe recently. Uh, and, and, uh, she said, and I, and I'm sorry. Good, good or evil Joe? Uh, evil Joe. Okay. <laughs> I, I would say that as a joke and everybody knows exactly. Right. Oh, okay. So Joe Kelly or Joe Casey, of course. Yes. I'm assuming, but yes, it was Casey. And uh, he said that uh, they're printing an omnibus of uh, the X Men run. And uh, were you part of that uh, run? Is that are you in that omnibus as well? I know nothing about that. They reprinted uh, Joe Kelly and and I did the books at the same time. That's where we met, actually. Uh, I I had worked my way up through comics for a decade plus, and you know did my Alpha Flight script, turned it in, and they're like, "We want to put you on the X Men." I'm like, "No, no, I'm good," because I'd already do <laughs> Wolverine, and uh, and. Then uh, Joe Kelly graduates and gets X Men. I'm like, what? What? This guy is an asshole. What are we talking about? He didn't have to work for this. He debuts in the top spot. What are we talking about here? So I was just instantly, I hated him. And I was like, I can't wait to meet this guy. And I'm going to hate him to his face. And I flew to New York for the story conference. And Joe was in a shared car with me to drive us to the place where they had the, the uh, meeting. And he couldn't have been nicer. And I was like, Damn it. Why can't he be awful? I want to hate this nice guy. guy. <laughs> and by the end of the ride, I was super car sick because I have to drive or I get car sick. And okay. he was like taking care of me. And I'm like, and he's, and he's a nurse and he's kind. And he's like, oh, damn it. So now we're lifelong friends because he was just too nice the day I met him to hate. Uh, but so we did those books at the same time. And yeah. uh, it was it was not a good time to be working at Marvel is the shortest answer to that. They were bankrupt. Uh, and though that was the first comic I ever bought myself was X-Men 114. Awesome. And, uh, and I was excited to do it. It was the wrong time to do it. Like Joe and I did all this world building. We had this great story to tell. They all approved it. And then the company financially took a left turn and they're like, get rid of all that shit. You got to just put Gambit back in the book. You got to do this. You got to, which they can do. That is their right to do. Oh, they sure. own the company. They own the characters. Yeah. If you're the thing that's making money, they're going to do stuff to it. But it was really uh, disheartening to do. The stories we could have told were a lot better than the stories we had to tell. Uh, and they rewrote everything we did. Just constant uh. piles of dialogue that, you know, A, too much dialogue. But B, I just said to the editors, I was like, look, you can call me at 12 in the morning. You can call me at 2 in the morning. You can give me a one hour deadline. I want the words in the comic to be the words I write, not words I'm reading and going, I would never say that. This character wouldn't talk that way, you know, whatever. And we just, neither Joe or I could ever get them to do that. And we kept saying, we're going to, we're going to walk if we can't have the words be our words. And they just never were. And we walked. So wow. we stayed about a year and a half. There were good moments. I worked with Chris Pacello, which was lovely. Uh, I worked with Joe, which I still work with Joe. Duncan and Joe were also at those X-Men story conferences. That's why there's kind of this co configuration man of action. Because sure. we gravitated to each other's ideas. 
uh, and thought we could work. We're not alike, but we could work together. Um, and so a lot of good came of it. And people love those runs. I used to go, you shouldn't because I was wrong. But, you know, wah, wah, wah for me. If people like them, I love that they like them. I wish they could have read them as I wrote them. And I wish they could have read the stuff Joe and I had in mind. Uh, but I, I'm happy people love them if they love them. There's a, new, a different regime now in Marvel. Hell, there's been two or three since that time. Uh, oh yeah. Are you are you friendly with Marvel? Or are you? Uh, do you ever pitch? Do they ever come to you? Oh, they never come to me. You know, not a surprise really. But I don't I don't pitch because Image will. If I go, hey Image, I want to put out a book of essays. Eric Stevenson will go. We'll do it. If I go, I want to put out Camp Midnight, a kids book. We'll do it. I want to put out The Red Diary, Super Experimental. We'll do it. So I don't. I've not had any reason to go back there and do anything. Uh, and I always was like, oh, I wish I could have done my Daredevil story. But you know what? Frank Miller's Daredevil story I reread in the pandemic. It's good enough. Brian Bendis' I reread in the pandemic. It's good enough. I don't need to do one. Those are good. That's good. Well, and I get that, man, because truly you did. You you had, you had Again, you've described a, a, a difficult situation in Marvel. But certainly at DC, you had a lot of great stuff. And I, don't, I mean, really... That's why I, I kind of felt like you guys all, the four of you, really were like, you know, uh, the rat race is fine. Tell you what, we're going to make our own stuff. See you later. And it's been great. You know, I think if somebody uh, came to us and said, do Marvel Knights somewhere, you know, where it's like Joe Quesada getting a little fiefdom of characters that they world build, because that's what our company does. Man of Action is a world build company. Yeah. They come to us and they go, like, Sonic came to us. They're like, we want to do a new Sonic show. We're like, we are going to build you a completely new world for Sonic to be in. I didn't in. know that. That's great. I didn't know it's you on Netflix it, right now. You can watch wow. it. It's very cool. It drops out in the second oh. drop. I don't know when it comes out. Oh, that's oh, that's great, man. Shame on me. I didn't realize. Uh, yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. But uh, sure. that's what we do. So I think if yeah. we went back in a big way to mainstream comics, that would be what would be appealing because that's what we do now. Uh, but otherwise, I'd rather read the cool ideas other people have and work in my weird ways and give people the weird stuff that I'm more inclined to do. You, I mean, of course, too, you had, uh, you know, you had uh, the uh, Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon and you had the Avengers cartoon as well that you guys did. Um, you know, what, and especially now that you mentioned that you're, you know, got the Sonic show at Netflix and everything. Is there a big difference dealing with a streaming network versus an over-the-air network? There, there were some big differences, but you know, so when Netflix started and we would go pitch shows to them, it was like three people and they would just go, yes, no. And that was it. And over time, Netflix has gotten much bigger and now there's a bunch of people and then they'll hire people and they'll lay people off and they'll hire people and they'll lay people off. And it developmentally wise, like when you're pitching new material to them or pitching existing franchises in new configurations or whatever, it's, it's gotten a bit more like what the networks were, but the networks like Cartoon Network not really a network at this point you know it's uh it's a, a piece of hbo max well now just max i'm here uh, yeah but it's not really a studio it's not a functioning studio that stuff's now all made through a centralized body at, at warner brothers slash max and then they go well that's a cartoon network show so the kind of old models aren't there and where they are it's just kind of a new configuration most of the people at nick at uh, netflix or apple or uh, Amazon Ooh. or wherever, they're all people we knew from other places that were more traditional cable networks or broadcast networks. So that's how they came up. That's what they're more used to. There's some differences, but it's you know, different place, same nice people. Good. Uh, you know, orders have gotten shorter. We used to do a ton more episodes, now you do fewer, uh, so they have to be even better. Uh, I prefer that. I'd rather just think of a complete story and move on to the next one, so that's good with me. Um, but it's it's very different than doing serialized. You know, when we were doing Spider-Man, we were doing 26 at a clip. And most streaming things right now are eight episodes at a clip. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you, man. And that's the, that's the thing. I, uh, you know, honestly, and I think other people have been saying this and wondering as well um, what the future is for the over the air or over cable networks, given not only the strength of streaming as far as views, but also. Uh, people time shift and everything. So you wonder when when they're gonna, you know, that that change is gonna happen and that we really are gonna have to like buy 10 different streamers to really get uh, current programming or whatever. Yeah, and it's still this is all still being sorted out. I mean, there are so many mergers and consolidations and content being canceled, and you know, what it, it's a very 
disruptive time. That's why the strike is also uh, interesting in this kind of context. Yes. But the, the the big difference, I think, is this idea of watching it all. You know, it used to be that you were trying to hook people into watching a little bit of something and then a bunch of commercials, then a little bit of something and a bunch of commercials. And you wanted to keep them doing that for half a year. And then there'd be another half a year. And then there was the summer where you'd watch, uh, you know, people in bikinis jump over trampoline, <laughs> like, but with the idea of watching these commercials, and streaming said, no commercials, just watch the thing. The thing is the thing, which was great if you're a content creator. And then over time, of course, a very short period of time, they said, but how do we pay for all this? It's costing billions and there's no commercials. So now you've got all these streamers going, well, here's some commercial tiers that you can do to pay for that stuff because it costs billions. Well, no surprise. That's how it was on network TV. So network became cable, cable became streamers and streamers are becoming networks. And it's like, where did we get? We got some great TV out of it is where we got. I hear you, man. And in fact, uh, here back in the comments, uh, Mike Jones says uh, uh, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes cartoon was amazing for me. The best of those characters, uh, certainly in the uh, in the animated realm. And yeah, what a wonderful show. Absolutely. Well, so these cool. are two different shows. So Earth's Mightiest Thanks, Heroes man. is the one that preceded us. And we also worked on that a little bit. Um, the, the general reason people love Earth's Mightiest Heroes is because it's like the Avengers comic books we grew up with if we're a certain age. Yeah. Uh, so we yeah. did the last four episodes of that series. Uh, Jeff Lowe brought us in to, to do those when he kind of took over Marvel Animation. And we were like, hell yeah, we can do some of our favorite Avengers stories. So that was fun. <laughs> but then that show ended and the new Avengers was starting. And, you know, the, the job with all animated shows is you've got to make a show for kids. Like you want a six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old kid to fall in love with Spider-Man, to fall in love with the Avengers, to fall in love with Ben 10. Sure. And if you've done your job right, they stay with it and they become 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Or if you've done your job right, somebody who's like, I love the Avengers comics when I was you know, 12. Now I'm 40. I love this cartoon because it reminds me of those comics. The problem is like the, the 40s, 40 year olds who like Avengers cartoon, most of the time, a six year old doesn't like that because the things that are triggering not triggering in a bad way, but that are getting you excited about that right. yeah, yeah, are not there in the mind of a kid. So every once in a while, if you do one of those kind of more nostalgic shows, like some of the Batman cartoons deal more with the mythos, some deal less, you've got to create a new show to go, hey, kids, I want you to fall in love with Batman too. Because they're not going to fall in love with the comics. The comics are $4 a pop. They have gunshots to the head. You know, it's like you need a Batman that speaks to a kid. You need a Spider-Man that speaks to a kid. And so Joe Quesada was fully aware of what Spider-Man was and what the previous series of that had been. And same with the Avengers. And he was in our rooms and he was like, let go of that. You know, think about what is Spider-Man and make us a show that a kid will love, which is how Man of Action works anyway. We always start with what is the essence of something. If you just tell me Spider-Man, what do I think of? Before we do any research, before we look at anybody else's shows, what is it? What makes Spider-Man Spider-Man? What does it have to have to register? And we jot all that. Then we go, what did people do? What, what have other shows done? What are they? Because we don't want to do that. You don't need to do that again. There was Earth's Mightiest Heroes. It covered all the cool Roy Thomas, Stan Lee, whatever Avengers stories. You don't need to do it again. It's there. It will exist forever. Hopefully, though, they're pulling stuff off of streaming now. But uh, yeah. hopefully yeah. it exists forever. <laughs> and you can just go back to that version. So you've got to make a new version that a kid goes, this is my Spider-Man. I now love Spider-Man. And you know what? I love it so much, I'm going to look at the previous animated show and all those comics that are in all, in all those omnibus volumes and whatever. And as they mature, they look through all this other version, all this extra Spider-Man. The movies are doing a great job of that. They're for parents, they're for kids, they're for whatever. And that's that's what kind of a franchise experience is about. So I feel you, Mike Jones. I love Earth's Mightiest Heroes too. If Avengers Assemble didn't grab you, that's okay. Your show was Earth's Mightiest Heroes and Assemble was for kids younger than you and me. I hear you, man. You know, Lightfell and I were just talking about this last night. And again, you and I are pretty much the same age. I, uh, I, 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 my entry to Marvel was the 67 Ralph Bashke Spider-Man TV series and those Marvel superheroes cartoons. Yeah. As yeah. crudely animated as they were, you know, we were getting Kirby images and then the great uh, artists of, of the sixties. And, uh, and yeah, and it wasn't until I started seeing the treasury edition uh, comics of Marvel the Fantastic Four, the Avengers were ones right off the bat that I remember 
first reading and that's when i really got into the marvel universe but you're absolutely right man i mean it's um that is kind of the hard thing and i know that that was the problem with a couple dc animated projects like the green lantern tv series which all of us old farts farts loved and then they're like yeah but but they're not selling toys to the y7s and that's why we made this show well, and we Ben 10 sold a lot of toys, and thank goodness. Uh, Indeed. But, but to be <laughs> fair, we don't, even though that we know what the toy possibilities of that are, we knew when we made it up what they were. But that has that show has got to speak to a seven, eight, nine, ten year old kid. And so the show is Ben 10 is always about identification. Like a kid wishes they were taller, they wishes they were faster, they wish they could fly, they wish yeah. wish fulfillment because they feel like they're inferior to the forces around them. So the supervillain becomes a stand-in for a bully or for an older kid or for a taller kid or a faster kid or whatever. And I have the means to become that. But without training, I am not good at that. And so it turns out that what I need is not that watch or that power. You know, I need knowledge. I need experience. Gwen does all the same shit Ben does, but she doesn't have a watch. And she seems to survive just fine. That's lost on Ben, right? So you got to build the thing. And then if it sells toys, that'll keep it alive longer. But if the show does not speak to a kid who's six, seven, eight, nine years old, what they're going through, what matters to them, then it doesn't work. So like I was just at a wedding rolling around in the grass when I should have been paying attention with with a friend's kid, seeing what she was into. What did she run to? How did she play? What was she doing? You know, like I got to keep my kid brain learning all the time because it evolves over time. You know, I have my own kids now and I'm like, what are you watching? What's that video game you're playing? We do a lot of video games yeah. at Man of Action. Indeed. And I, I rarely played video games now i just sit 24 hours a day with my son and i'm like wait go back show me that cutscene again why do you like that who are you playing as what mods did you make to that costume like i've got to get in his head to do a good job of doing the work because it's not what i like you know it's not what i would do if i do a video game it would be like boring people talking about the 1930s or whatever but that's <laughs> not it like that's not my job my job is to make a thing that that he will play and love and identify with that's brilliant, man. You know, Mike wanted to know if uh, you guys are uh, possibly doing some more video game writing, and he respects uh, non-disclosure. Yes, so. they video games take a long time, and they have a lot of NDAs. So I, yes is the answer. I can't tell you anything about the ones we're working on. There are several. I can tell you that we teamed up with a, a company called Creation Station. That's whose wedding I was at. Shout out to Dylan, newly married, and Omar, whose kid I was playing with. Um, the, the All of us with Man of Action them uh, have been working – with uh i gotta get my company names right so i don't <laughs> i have so many game companies right now that i'm like if i slip up and say the wrong then i will have violated the nda let's just say the hello neighbor people uh i know their company name but now i'm not going to say it out of phobia uh and we're doing an animated series that's on youtube uh for hello neighbor which is a video oh, wow. game and we're doing a world build outside of that to go what more than the game exists and what story do we tell uh and so that's been really fascinating because uh you know, we are, we're dealing directly with the people who make the game and they're going, here's what we do. Here's what we don't do. Here's what we like about your show. Here's what we don't like. And it's, it's, you were talking about the difference between networks and streamers. This show is on YouTube because the people who are paying for the show are the people who own the property making their own show. So there's no in between, which is fascinating because I've become like the, we can't do that. Like there's nobody telling us not to do stuff. And I'm going, oh my gosh, that could get us in trouble. Or, oh my gosh, that, that seems, you know, dangerous. And it's fascinating because I'm the person who's always complaining about that person when we're working for like a bigger entity. And now I am that person. So I guess <laughs> there needs to be that person all the time. Uh, but that's on YouTube. There's, I think they put up two episodes as just a teaser, but there's going to be a lot of episodes. I can't say when. Sometimes. That's sometimes. excellent. No, Steve, truly, this has been such an education. And uh, I really appreciate you getting that granular in terms of the differences and uh, what you're doing in it and it's amazing that there are so many differences regarding animation and the differences that you impose on your comics and then making yeah. them as different as they are but the similarity if anybody's an aspiring writer my similarity that i would say for all of this is if i do a ben 10 if i do a weirdo graphic novel with an experimental form if i do sam and mystery theater if i do get naked if i do whatever i do my daredevil story at some point it needs to be something that matters to me. I've got to, I've got to give you something. You're paying for my work. I've got to go, here's what I have to tell you about Superman. And when I did It's a Bird, I was like, I don't like Superman and here's why. And here's why I think I'm wrong. Like that's what that book is. It's, it's going, if you don't like superheroes, I get you. I didn't either. 
but here's why Superman trumps whatever we're talking about. I give you something for your time, for your money. And I think that my worst work is where I go, I want to tell a really fun fill in the blank story with this fill in the blank villain that I always liked when I was a kid. That stuff is, there's nothing there. You know, it's, it's a photocopy of a photocopy. It doesn't have anything to do with me. If I did a daredevil story, you know, I'm not blind. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a New Yorker. That's not, I don't need to do that story, which Frank and Brian covered all that stuff. I mean, they're not that stuff either. So they're just better than me, but whatever. <laughs> um, but I've got to dig down and go, what do I know about justice? Like I do know some stuff about justice and I feel that I understand what I think is unjust in this world and what I think needs to be righted. That's the daredevil story I need to tell. Something, something that matters to me in that granular, hyper-personal way. And then I've got to figure out, and what if I was blind? And what if I was a lawyer? And what if I was a superhero? And put that over it. And I think too much stuff that I, I read a lot of comics, I watch a lot of cartoons, especially now that I have kids. And there's a lot of really well-made stuff where I go, but what is it about? Like, what did you give me or my kid or whoever? And I don't have an answer. So I'm, I try not to do that. Interesting. I know I hear you, man. You know, back in the day uh, when I was covering boxing regularly, my old editor, Bert, Bert Sugar of Boxing Illustrated, uh, given that we're, you know, here and I'm here in Illinois and he's like, you got to write a Red Grange uh, biography, uh, man. You, he goes, you know, University of Illinois would pay for that right away. Red Grange was a great uh, college football player mm -hmm. for Illinois back in the 20s. I'm saying this for the younger people. And <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm not interested. He's like, that's money on the table. I'm like, just like you said, I'm like, yeah, but I don't give a shit about Red Grange. <laughs> I absolutely respect him and what he accomplished. But if it doesn't speak to you. You can't do it. So, no, I hear you, man. I absolutely hear you. Jesus. Yeah. And then, like, Big Hero 6, which Duncan and I made up at Marvel. Yes, it did. You know, Disney did even better. Like, they they knew more things about these things we made up. It's like, people are like, do you like that? I'm like, do I like it? Like, I, it's, it's touching. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's whatever. Like, stuff can be done with stuff. They just found a really personal story to tell. I don't know whose person it was. And some of it was in there. Like, a hero in the comics lost his dad they changed that to a brother well there's a different dimension if it's your brother that's closer yeah. in age range you know in, in ours he built uh the battle suit version of his dead father to be both his mentor and his protector so in the disney version it's his protector uh but they made him squishy you know lovable huggable touchable like these things make it even better so i love franchise work you can add to stuff you can make it stronger um but i think a lot of times people are just it's not fan service. It's like self fan service where you're like, I love this so much. I want to write my own or draw my own or whatever. And you've got to make it your own. It can't just be a, a, a thing you remember fondly, or it'll just be a copy of a thing you remember fondly. Amen, man. No, I think that's a great writer's tip. And I, and I think that's a, that's a great place for us to stop. And I will thank Lisa and your, your kids for allowing us to talk as long as we have. But uh, oh man, I was trying to trying to write out to their bedtime, and now I got to go back and exist with my family. No, I'm <laughs> I'm happy to. I'm sure you are. That's seriously, man, and that's really great that uh, you adopted the kids, especially older kids, because that's tough. And I'm 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 really glad. I hope we are old fun. ourselves, so <laughs> we, we just kept back dating. Like, well, now we need kids who are seven and twelve. Now we need kids who are nine and thirteen. Now we need, and we just got so old that it was nine and sixteen that we needed. <laughs> Well, that's one. Now they're 12 and 19. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Oh man. Oh God. Well, that's really tough because the 12 year old is entering the, the teen years and she is on a tear right now on a tear. She's lovely and fantastic, but she's 12. Well, she was scared of me. You were telling me that uh, she saw me in black and she thought I was very creepy. I was so showing her some of, some of your other episodes. And she's like, he needs a light. He's creepy. Little, little, I mean, little, that is creepy. That's I, I understand. No, I'm almost, I'm almost a disembodied head. I can appreciate that. <laughs> if you squint, if you squint, you can see that I'm wearing a shirt. Thank God. All right. Tell me how much I owe you for anybody who couldn't contribute. Oh, everybody Steve. who did, thank you, and everybody who didn't, thank you anyway. Great questions, and you're very, you're very kind, Steve. I, I genuinely appreciate it. And uh, everybody, thanks a lot. You had great questions, and thank you for uh, for watching. And uh, Steve, uh, please come back when. Either the dynamite announcement becomes real, or whatever Ooh. your next whatever your next thing is. I mean, absolutely. You know, and nice so to good. see everybody. Oh, and somebody asked about Primal Force. It's never time to bring back Primal Force, according to DC. But thanks for asking, Stephen. Oh wow, uh, yeah. And uh, and was Primal Force the one that came out of Zero Hour? Yes. Okay, I don't remember that story. Well, next you... time, next time we'll talk good. about. It. Good, you're <laughs> Steve. You're thinking that's excellent, man. No, I'm so glad we finally did this. 
uh, it exceeded expectations, and I love where the conversation went, and you gave us a lot to think about. So I'm thanks just a lot. You had low expectations. See yeah. you next time. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Steve Siegel, everybody. Tomorrow night, uh, it's my uh, nerd passion of Star Trek coming through. We're a week away from uh, second season two of uh, the Pike Show, Strange New Worlds. And uh, me and the guys uh, that uh, normally uh, review shows and stuff will be discussing season one with a with a newbie who just watched season one uh, through the library. I know that right now they're running season one on YouTube for free mm -hmm. for the rest of the month. But uh, yeah, in anticipation of season two, we'll review season one. So that's happening Thursday. Friday, I'm talking to Andy Parks. Andy's got Ooh, nice. uh, a new adaptation of one of his stories is uh, on Netflix as well. We're going to be talking about that. So that's how uh, oh, I said hello. I haven't seen him in a decade or more. I absolutely will. No, that'll be great, man. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed it until next time. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. <laughs> <laughs>